Mel Keel, the Regional Land Care Coordinator for the Central West. On behalf of my team, Rowan Leach and Sharon Cuneal, thanks for joining us and welcome to our third session of Future Proof Your Business with Paul Ryan. I would like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we all meet today and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge local land services, New South Wales Land Care and the National Land Care Program for supporting this webinar series. Now for some housekeeping. Please keep your camera off and your microphone muted during the 30 minute presentation. To eliminate any technology failures as we encountered in session two, we have decided to pre-record today's presentation, but we have Paul live on the line to answer questions at the conclusion. Please type any comments or questions into the chat box as they come to you, or wait to the end and raise your hand using the icon in the toolbar to ask that question. Please be aware that we will be recording this session for a future resource, and by continuing, you can send to this recording. Each participant will receive an email with a link to the recorded presentation, slides, and other relevant information within 24 hours. We value your feedback, so keep an eye out in the chat section towards the end of Paul's presentation for a survey link. This will be included in your email and by filling it in, you will go into the draw to win a book. I am thrilled now to invite our presenter for the series, Paul Ryan from the Australian Resilience Centre to begin session three. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mel, and uh, welcome to everyone joining us. Uh, if you if you're coming back from the last couple of sessions, um, welcome back. If you're joining new to this session, um, a very warm welcome to you. What I'm going to do today is talk about moving from some of the earlier things we talked about about defining resilience and and um, diagnosing some of those resilience issues into talking about designing resilient uh, actions and strategies. So I'm just going to share my screen. I've got some slides here to run through. The, the um, focus, as I said in the first session, was really about um, understanding that resilience is about understanding ourselves as part of systems. We're connected to, to systems, whether that's our, our family, our local community, our landscape, our production system, our, you know, the consumers, all of that sort of stuff, we're part of systems. And when we talk about resilience of systems, it's not just about bouncing back. And, and we've had, you know, a lot of uh, discussion about our economy bouncing back after COVID and uh, after bushfires and all that sort of stuff. And that's a that's an important idea, but it's also about bouncing forward. We don't just want to recover back to where we were we want to have the capacity, the ability to, to bounce forward, to, to move forward and to become something else if we need to. And we talked a lot about in the first session about this idea of a stress curve. And this is about the stress that's on us personally. It can be the stress that's on our business. It could be the stress that's on our landscape or on our community. And that there's a, there's a kind of predictable shape to that curve. And um, the real message here is that we can't sustain periods of high stress, um, whether that's individually or whether it's us as a community or whether it's our landscape. We can we can peak there and be there for a while, but we don't want to be operating up in that period of, of high stress for too long, uh, particularly personally at the individual level, psychologically, we just simply are not built to operate in periods of high stress for too long. It's going to impact on us. Uh, physically, uh, health-wise, physical health-wise and mental health-wise if we're in that stressful situation. So we talked about resilience building and the idea that resilience building can help flatten the curve. That's really what we're trying to do when we're building resilience. We're not going to get rid of shocks and events, the things that are going to come along and stress us, but what we can do is be better prepared for them, we can respond to them and we can recover better. And that's really what we're about is flattening that curve, shortening the tail so that the stress um, is uh, peaks for the minimum amount of time. And then as soon as we can, we can get it back to a level that's manageable. In the second session, we, we talked about diagnosing resilience issues. And, and these are just two little kind of tools that we use all the time. Yeah, the one on the left is is called the adaptive cycle or the boom and bust cycle and basically it helps us to understand that 
systems go through cycles and that happens regardless of what we do, that this is going to happen because of the way systems work and things interact. They go through these cycles and those cycles have periods of growth through to maturity and that's when things are going well and we might not be experiencing much stress on us individually or on our business or on our landscape or our community. But then we're going to have periods where we go through these big release phases and, and that's when we really are going to experience a lot of stress and we're going to lose a lot of connections. Um, we're going to lose a lot of potential or capital in the system. Um, and the message here is we just need to be prepared for that. That is going to happen. We can't hold it at that mature phase uh, for very long. And the more we do, uh, the more vulnerable, vulnerable we become to that big release. So it's about being prepared for the cycles of change that we're going to go through and thinking about when are the opportunities here. So there are opportunities in that cycle. The one on the right is is a, an iceberg diagram, we call it. And the fact, uh, the main message here is really that events are the tip of the iceberg. So the big things that kind of come along and impact on us, they're really important. We need to respond to them, but they're actually the tip of the iceberg. And if we want to make change, we need to get down below the water. And that's where I want to pick up in this session is to talk about those events and what, you know, how we typically sort of try to deal with them is we try to do this bouncing back and, and that's important. We have to bounce back from events, you know, particularly things like fire and drought. We want to get back to where we were um, and we want to be able to recover our life and recover the things that are important to us, of course. The challenge is if it's part of a pattern, a repeated pattern. So if we're in a cycle of, you know, uh, uh, frequent droughts, if we're in a cycle of, um, you know, frequent bushfire, uh, commodity price up and downs, or, you know, stresses in our personal life or in, you know, our community or whatever it might be. If we just keep trying to bounce back, if our actions, our resilience actions that we're trying to put in place are just about bouncing back, um, that's not going to cut it. We, we've really got to think about that bouncing forward because, um, and I'll explain in a minute why that sort of just pattern of working on bouncing back is not going to get us there. And I touched on this idea in the last session about the need for a kind of deeper strategy, if you like, to cope with um, events and particularly these regular patterns of events. And there's really three sort of overarching strategies that would, would um, help us to think about, you know, how we, we manage these kind of repeated patterns. The first is this idea of persistence. And, and this is very much about that bouncing back idea that we're just trying to get back to business as usual and keep, keep operating like that. The middle one there is adaptation, which is kind of deliberate actions to, to start to try to move away or overcome some of those problems from those patterns and those events that keep happening. So that's a kind of deliberate strategy to move in a direction that helps us get away from, you know, the impact of those events. And the last one there is transformation, which is really about much more substantial change. It's about really deliberately trying to move well away from those events and those patterns. And that could even mean, you know, really fundamental transformation, personal transformation, not being in the farm, not being in the business, doing something fundamentally different. So that's right up the other end. And we use this, the, the kind of analogy of, of shoes here. And persistence really is like the old slippers, putting on the comfortable slippers. There's nothing wrong with slippers. Um, they're comfortable. They're, you know what you're going to get every time you put them on and you're not going to get a blister wearing, wearing slippers. But the problem with that is it's too comfortable. And if we just work on basically bouncing back all the time to what we know to try to get back because that's where we feel most comfortable, over time that's going to present problems. And I'll come back to that in a minute. If we, if we think about adaptation kind of from the shoes perspective is it's about, you know, starting to move in a different direction and it's about having the, the, the capacity to kind of do something different. It's, it's still, you know, still walking in shoes, but, but we're walking in different shoes and, and they've got some capacity to do something different compared with what the slippers have. And finally, um, hopefully not too many of us are getting around in these, but this idea that, you know, transformation really is a fundamental shift in identity. 
um, it's a it's a major change. It's not just about walking in slippers or walking in slightly flasher slippers. This is actually about doing something fundamentally different. And obviously, that's going to take time and practice. You're not going to get it right first time, and it's going to hurt. There's going to be blisters um, if you're going to make that sort of change. So it's a useful kind of idea to keep in your mind about, you know, when have I got the slippers on here or when am I trying to walk in high heels? Because it, it actually helps you to think about, am I just slipping back into these kind of repeated patterns? I'm just trying to get back to where I were, where I was before, where we were before, or am I trying to move in a different direction or, you know, trying to move in a very different direction and create something fundamentally new? The problem with just this bouncing back strategy, bouncing back to the slippers to business as usual, is if, if we keep doing that time and time again through repeated events is at some point we're going to get exhausted. And that might be, you know, exhausted physically and mentally personally, but it also might be we exhaust our, our country, our landscape, our soil. It might be we exhaust our bank account yes, um, or our or whatever it might be. But the point is we're going to run down the system. We're going to run us run down our resources, our resource base. We're going to run ourselves down. Just fighting to get back to the same thing and getting knocked back again, and fighting to get back there again. Um, yeah, ultimately you're going to not succeed because you're going to wear down. You're wearing down in some way. You're either wearing down your country, you're wearing down your machinery, you're wearing down your relationships, you're wearing down. You know your your. Um, your ability in yourself to keep doing it and that's not good you know that's ultimately not a great place to be and and that strategy in the long term is is going to do more harm than good so we can start to say yeah some of the bouncing back can be about doing different things and that's that's useful of course but really it's this idea about thinking about bouncing forward and and like i say that's doing very different things and and trying to think about how do we just not get back to where we were? How do we get to somewhere new? So what I want to focus on in this session really is around some, some design ideas, design rules for, for resilience. So if we're trying to design how we're going to move forward, we want to do that in a way that can cope with all of the challenges and all of the uncertainties about that future, because we don't know what the future is going to hold. And we don't know what we're going to need uh, as we go forward. You know, we, if we, especially if we're going to try to sort of do something different, if we're going to be adapting and if we're going to be transforming and really pushing you know, to, to get away from just doing that business as usual and bouncing back, it, it's going to have a lot of uncertainty. It's going to feel uncomfortable. And so we want to have some rules, some design rules, if you like, in our pocket that can give us some confidence that, we're heading in a, a, a positive direction, but also if things don't go as planned, is you know is what we're putting in place going to work for a different future than what we expected? So there's a set of a set of kind of design rules here. They come from a longer set of principles about resilience that have been around for a long time, and they they help us to think about um, the the way we can design. The, our actions and our strategies to be more resilient. And the first one, it's a really basic one, but it's really important, which is plan for change, not for stability. So if we plan for change, then we're not going to be surprised when we get change. And humans have a tendency to try to, you know, constantly think that the world is going to be, you know, the, the future will be like it was in the past. And, and, that's a real challenge for us as, as people, as a species, we tend to just focus on, you know, wanting things to be like they were in the past. And there's lots of great examples of this. And the, and the, di the picture here is, is um, an engineer at Kodak, and this is the guy that invented digital cameras. So Kodak was one of the biggest companies in the world. It was the equivalent of Apple in its day. Uh, had 150,000 or close to 150,000 employees, massive market um, capitalization value. It, this is an incredible organization. And you think about what Kodak did in terms of, you know, the happy snap cameras and all of that stuff that it fundamentally changed even the way people got together and made memories, you know, like it really shaped 
uh, our culture about, you know, getting together and taking photos of things that, that just wasn't part of the, the past. Kodak kind of invented this whole idea of getting together and capturing moments and all of that sort of stuff. They invented this um, digital camera. It weighed seven kilos, which is interesting. Um, and uh, But th they did this in the sort of 70s and 80s. They started to work on this technology. But the reality is the company strategy was to continue to make films, you know, and the film that went in cameras. And they really didn't see their future at all in technology and in making cameras. They thought they made the stuff that goes in cameras. Meanwhile, a bunch of other companies, Fujifilm is one, but there was a number of others that, that saw the writing on the wall, knew that digital cameras would, would supersede all the other technologies out there, and they just switched over to making cameras uh, and not worried about making film. And, you know, consequently in 2012, Kodak went bankrupt. It's, it's kind of struggled and reformed in different um, various sort of structures. But the reality is it's, it's nothing absolutely nothing compared with what it was. And that was based primarily on the assumption that, you know, the future was going to be pretty similar to the past and that they could continue to operate in that same sort of way. The other one is to ask yourself some what-if questions. So this photo is, is of a bridge in Honduras. Um, this is a, Honduras has a, a long history of having severe cyclones. Um, they designed this bridge, which is in a, a, a fairly major uh, city. And the bridge was designed to withstand um, hurricanes and cyclones. So they got the best engineers from around the world, um, I think mainly Japanese engineers, to help them design this um, structure so that it could withstand hurricanes. What they didn't anticipate is that the river would move. And so ultimately this bridge is just stuck out there like a sore thumb yeah, it's a bridge to nowhere because, you know, one of the critical assumptions here was that the river was going to stay in the same place and, you know, it evolved for a whole range of, you know, sort of hydrological and, and geomorphological reasons that the river moved. But the reality is that the bridge um, didn't move, obviously. And so asking some what if questions and asking yourself some really hard questions about what if this happens, what could happen in the future? That sort of thing helps us to prepare and plan for change. The next one's about building and maintaining diversity. And, and I think a lot of people, you know, that are probably on this call are really aware about just the importance of maintaining diversity across the landscape, across your production system, the role of, you know, diverse native pastures and pasture cropping and all of those sorts of things. But it also extends to things like diversity of, um, um, you know, production types, diversity of income, but also to things uh, like the diversity of knowledge that we have and where we get that knowledge. So these little diagrams here on the right are social networks. They're networks of farmers. Um, and this was work that was done to look at how people make decisions and, and how they uh, make big decisions, particularly in the face of a changing climate. So the people on the top here, the pink dot represents a person and all of those other little white dots and the lines between them represent some connections between that person and other people. The people at the top here, through surveys, were judged to be what were called incremental adapters. And so I'd put them in our, in our um, wearing the slippers. So essentially they're kind of in a persistence mode. They're just making small adjustments to their business, to their farming business to get by. At the bottom are what were called transformational adapters. So these are people that were making major kind of decisions and shifts about direction in, in their business. The ones that on, uh, on, on the left, the diagrams on the left are the social networks of these groups. And so you can see the incremental adapters had these incredibly strong social networks. They had lots of people around them, lots of friends, very tight social networks. The transformational adapters had far sparser networks, social networks. They just didn't have as many connections at all. What's interesting is if you look at their information networks, you see exactly the opposite. That is that the incremental adapters had really poor or really sparse information networks and the transformational adapters have really um, strong, well-developed information networks. And one of the messages here is that basically, you know, if we're trying to do change, 
um, just relying on the people around us uh, for our information and for our kind of inspiration may not be the best thing. Um, that, that social network is partly, you know, keep might be holding us back from making those bigger changes. In contrast, if you want to make, you know, those bigger changes, you're really having a strong information network, exposing yourself to lots of different types of information um, from different sources is really useful. And I guess it's a really important question to ask yourself is where do you get most of your information from? If it's coming mainly from, you know, your social network and the people around you, that, that might be limiting your ability to see other options and to see new opportunities uh, for that bouncing forward that we talked about. And it may be that you're just being held back socially as well by, you know, peer group pressure, which is really subtle but important in terms of people adopting new practices and new ideas. It's just something to think about. The third one's about redundancy. And redundancy is kind of a, you know, a bad word in today's society, but actually from a resilience point of view, redundancy is really valuable. And the image there is from the Longford gas explosion in Victoria. A lot of people wouldn't remember this. This is back in the 19, late 1990s, 98, I think it was. The, um, this is the, the, the treatment or the um, processing plant, gas processing plant at Longford in Gippsland that processed all of the gas that came onshore from the offshore gas platforms. All of the gas that came onshore went through this one processing plant. And there was an industrial accident as a whole Royal Commission about what happened. And, you know, there's a number of really interesting things about what exactly what happened here. But one of the key messages was that this was the single gas treatment plant for Victoria. So an industrial accident there, it knocks out the gas supply for the whole state, just about 1.4 million households affected, 89,000 businesses affected, a couple of billion dollars of um, impact in over three weeks or four weeks or whatever it was while the gas was being restored. And also, you know, really curious kind of knock-on effects. So, um, you know, I'm from Northern Victoria up here and they, the uh, most of the um, milk processing plants, there's a big dairy industry here, most of the milk processing plants were relying on gas coming from this gas plant. When the gas wasn't available, they had no backup systems. So they weren't processing milk, so farmers weren't able to, to deliver their milk or sell their milk to the factory. The farmers, summer farmers were forced to just dump milk down the drain. Some of that got into local waterways and caused fish kills. Nothing to do with the gas plant blowing up, of course, but, you know, just that knock-on effect, a systems effect. But the message here is that, you know, redundancy, um, while it has a cost, actually is incredibly valuable. And um, having backups and, and spares whether that's spare machinery or literally spare parts for, for the machinery, having those um, is resiliency in action. It, even if they're never used, having them gives the system resilience and in itself that's valuable. And we often don't value that in today's society. So, you know, we're often about efficiency and I think we've seen that with the COVID and food supply issues and panic buying is that, you know, we've got this just in time there's no backups in the system. There's no fat anywhere in the system. Well, you know, that means we've got systems that are low in resilience. Having backups, having spares in the, in the system is resilience in action. And it's something that, you know, we need to kind of be more conscious of. It does have a cost and that's an issue. And, and working out how do we carry that cost, if, especially as a small business operator, or, you know, or a farm business, you might not be able to carry that cost. But are there ways that you can have backups within the community? Um, or across a number of farms, those sort of things for critical bits of gear or whatever. The fourth one is about designing for flexibility. And, and this is a sort of no brainer in a way, but it's really hard to do. There's some really simple ideas. So even where things are relatively rigid, so think about a road network, you know, see these in Sydney and Melbourne, these types of setups. It's really hard to expand once you build a road and all the houses build around it, it's really hard to change the design of that. So you don't have a lot of flexibility, but even within that rigid structure, there's an opportunity to have some flexibility. And this is this idea of um, dynamic lane sharing or, or, or um, lane allocation. 
So just by changing the function of it, so you're not changing the structure, you're just changing the function. So in the morning you have two lanes going that way and in the afternoon you have two lanes going that way. Is a way to introduce flexibility into something that seems fairly rigid. And if we put our minds to it, there's lots of ways that we can do that in, in our own business, with our own gear, in our own um, community, our own landscape, thinking about ways that we can bring in more flexibility. Um, again, you know, here in Northern Victoria, there's a massive program to upgrade the irrigation infrastructure, $2 billion of public money, incredibly, you know, expensive um, investment in, in lining channels and building all sorts of new infrastructure. While that infrastructure has been built over the last decade, the whole system around it, because it's much more flexible, the farming system and the decisions that farmers make and, and you know, to buy and sell water and change commodities has been changing rapidly. This bit, the irrigation infrastructure, has been designed to be stable and not very flexible um, for lots of good reasons at the time. But the reality is now a lot of that is, is not um, very useful. A lot of it's going to end up as stranded assets. You've got a big um, bit of infrastructure there that the community or someone's got to pay for or government's got to pay for or the irrigators got to pay for because uh, lots of other irrigators are going to walk away from it because they've changed because they're much more flexible. So thinking about where is the flexibility in the system, which bits can change fast, which bits are slow, all those sorts of things, and trying to design in as much flexibility as possible because you never know how you're going to need it in the future. You never know how you're going to use some infrastructure or some gear in the future. And it's much cheaper if you can to get flexibility in at the start than trying to retrofit later or repair later on. So designing in flexibility is a really core resilience strategy. The next one is about thinking about managing networks and connectivity. And I've used the example of corridors here, but I'll touch on another example first, which is, um, that funny looking diagram there on the right uh, of all those dots is actually a social network. So this is from one single town in the US. And the researchers here have mapped the social connections in this town for three generations now. So they, they started just doing it to understand, um, it was actually a health study about um, heart and um, uh, smoking and other issues like that. But they noticed that they could, by tracking the social connections and then asking those people and surveying them every few years about a whole range of things, they could understand what was happening in this network. And, and what it turns out is a whole range of really interesting things are happening in this network. This map actually indicates that different colours indicate um, uh, body mass index. So uh, the green are smaller body mass index, the, the yellow and orange, you can't really pick up colours very well there, but are, you know, larger overweight people. They also did it for a range of other things that I'll get onto in a minute. But, but what this map shows is that actually things cluster in these networks, in the social network. So things like obesity aren't random across this network. And, and this is one of the really key sort of insights of this study is that these things um, are not kind of randomly distributed as you'd expect. There's clusters of them and that, that if there's, you know, one over, overweight person or obese person, they're likely to be connected to another obese person. What's really curious is they also found the same relationship for emotions. So things like depression, unhappiness, things like smoking, all sorts of different types of things are moving in this network. So it's not it's not the, the people aren't moving and clustering together, it's the emotion. Uh, it's the um, phenomenon around smoking and weight loss, other health issues, etc. So these networks, the network around us, the kind of invisible structure that we don't see, we can't see until it's mapped like this, is actually having a really key influence on the health and the happiness of people in this community. Uh, and that's a really important message for us is about what networks can do. So other, other things in networks, you know, that we're much more familiar with that we can see in, in rural landscapes, things like, you know, networks of vegetation, waterway networks, um, you know, the, the networks we see around us in terms of power grids and all of those sorts of things. 
Both things have the ability to spread um, really good things, obviously, but they also have the ability to spread bad things. And we really want to think about the connections and designing them in ways that minimise the good, uh, maximise the good, minimise the bad, because we can spread things through networks inadvertently without even knowing it. And, you know, COVID's another good example about how something spread rapidly through networks. Second last one here is on focusing on particular changes, slow changes in particular that happen around us. And these are things that are hard to see again. So we tend to focus on the things we can see, the, the fast, the big events are the things that kind of capture our attention. But these three diagrams have got something in common. Um, all of them aren't breeding or reproducing. I'm, I'm not 100% sure about the ones on the left. Maybe some of them are still reproducing, but by and large, uh, these things aren't reproducing. So we can look at a landscape and we can say, yep, there's a lot of people in this landscape. Um, there's some, some birds and animals and wildlife, there's trees when we drive around and look at it. The reality is though, if we're not really looking closely, if these things aren't self-sustaining and reproducing, they're not going to be there at some point in the future. They're going to hit a tipping point. So the Kualoos in the middle there, um, evidence now that they live maybe 20 or 25 years. So that's a bird that, you know, a lot of people would have grown up with and heard. Uh, certainly here in Northern Victoria, we grew up with them and we heard them around from all of my life growing up. But the fact, reality is they weren't breeding. And so one day they just go off, a, off the cliff and they just disappear. And the populations seem to just plummet fairly quickly. And it's because they're a long lived bird. Same with scattered trees. The, the blokes in the footy jumper here are, are, are similar in, in many ways, not in the fact that they're not breeding, but the fact is we have these kind of social systems um, that rely on, you know, a relatively small number of people in rural landscapes, a lot of young people are disappearing. And so we get this hollowing out of our demographics where we've got a lot of older people, younger people, but the younger people keep disappearing as they get to that age where they go off to the city or go to larger centres to get jobs. And so a lot of our kind of social networks and our social structures, the things that are really important to us, you know, suddenly start to decline fairly quickly as people get to certain ages. And we've seen it with churches particularly, and, and that's a really prominent one. And if you drive around most landscapes, you see there so many unused churches. And that to me is a real sign of, of this one. But so keeping our eye on what's changing slowly and, and understanding that those slow changes are the things that grind you to the edge and then it's the tipping point, you go over the tipping point, but it's actually been the long, slow grinding change that's ground you right up to that tipping point and then a small little, last little push puts you over the edge and suddenly things change quickly. Keeping our eye on slow changes can be one of the best things we can do to understand the resilience of our system and how it's changing. So, you know, slow, slow changes escape our attention until we hit a tipping point. And the last one here, which is, it's easy to say, but it's hard to do in practice, but it's really about learning. And, you know, I'm not talking about learning here in the formal sense. I'm talking about learning from what's happening around us. And that's hard to do because of the pace of the world and we're all so busy, but actually stopping and asking ourselves, what did I learn from the last big event? And the, diet, the picture here is from uh, Cyclone Larry up in Queensland. You know, t major cyclone that had huge impacts on some particular farming industries like the banana industry, for example. What they did was straight after that was there was surveys done of just asking people, what, what did you do to recover? So what did you do to survive the event itself? You know, the, the actual physical uh, event of the cyclone. And then what did you do in your business to, to recover? And... There was a whole lot of fantastic information that came out of that, which was then sort of packaged up and used when they had the Yazi and a series of cyclones there, you know, a few years back, one after the other. The information got better and better. So the information for growers, the information for people in towns and communities, and just the information for people making decisions and deciding, you know, how are they going to um, ride out these cyclones actually improved to the point where you would have heard Anna Bly in the lead up to some of the, you know, the last big um, cyclones in Queensland saying things like you need to get fuel in your car. So you need to, to fill your car with fuel. You need an inverter um, to plug into your lighter in your car because what we found from the last two, you know, cyclones was 
if you've got an inverter, if you've got petrol in your car, you can charge, you know, you can use your inverter to charge your phone, charge your laptop. Um, and, but she also said things like get um, 300 bucks cash per person um, in your household and have cash because, you know, that's a basic idea, but it's one of the most convertible forms of, of kind of capital that you've got. You can use it to buy all sorts of things. You can buy more energy in terms of petrol. You can buy accommodation. You can buy food. You can buy labour. Um, you know, you can buy repair um, stuff that you need to have repaired, etc. That's a really simple kind of idea, but the, the message here is we, we often don't learn from what's happened in the past. And if we want to get off this treadmill of moving away from just recovering and starting to move towards, you know, a, a, a kind of more focus on future proofing, learning is one of the key things that we can do. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more in the next data, in the next session in a bit more detail, because it's actually, such a cornerstone of, of trying to move towards more resilient futures. So if we're thinking about these strategies, you know, these kind of strategies, how do we move beyond just actions that take us back to where we were and start to move towards actions that take us forward? These, these rules, these design rules can help to give us some confidence, some insurance. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about these actions or whether we're talking at this high level about these higher level strategies using these rules, kind of getting them in there into every level and using those rules to help design the way we think about the future can really help us think about future proofing so that we can cope with whatever event comes along because we're not trying to predict the future, we're just trying to respond and prepare to be able to respond to any challenges that come along uh, in the future. So that's a lot of information, but, uh, but if you, um, if you're interested, we're going to have some questions now and happy to, to take any questions and, and be really interested in hear people's reflections and responses and, and even some of those things around what have you learnt from some of the bigger events that you've been through or some of the best advice that you've got. So in summary, just if I go back over just the, the key points here, you know, we, we can't just rely on bouncing back those actions. Ultimately, we really want to... Um, move towards this kind of not just persisting but strategies to adapt and transform and we can use those rules to help us design those and that that way we can be confident as we move towards the future that we've we've designed to cope with the widest range of futures and that's where i end it so thanks folks and we'll, we'll move on to some questions Great, thanks, Paul. That was terrific. Uh, so we'll just head into some questions now. Um, I think I'll just a bit of a look in the chat box. So Mel, there's there's a comment there from Terry, which I think's really interesting about. There's been a lot of sort of, you know. Uh, workshops and, and online uh, webinars sort of things about business support and this idea of sort of lean business um, as, as the way to go. And, and I, Terry, I reckon it's really interesting. That to me is one of the big challenges is there's this pressure that, you know, you have to be lean to be successful. But as we've seen through COVID, so many businesses that, that haven't been able to survive. And, and it's really because of that leanness in my mind. Like when you look at the sort of supply chain idea of, of just in time function of, of many of our kind of systems, as soon as they came under pressure, they collapsed really quickly. And that is a, a result of not having resilience in the system. That's, that's not having that fat there. And this is the real tension is to have, how do you have, um, how do you have this sort of fat on the bone? How do you keep this a bit of fat in the system? when you're constantly under pressure to sort of be running very lean and, and I reckon that's a real challenge, real tension. But I, to me, I think the evidence is pretty clear that as when times are good, of course, you know, you don't you don't need those those um, shock absorbers. But as soon as as soon as things, you know, an event comes along, suddenly you need it and you're in real strife. So it's like paying for insurance. You don't need it till you need it. And I think some of this kind of resilience stuff is system insurance that we you don't need it till you need it. But. 
Yeah, great, Paul. Uh, I just took something small from it, but the plan for change, not for stability, was excellent little phrase. I thought was um, everyone could, you know, pop that into their their framework. Rowan. Great, thanks, Mel. Um, yeah, I just had a, a great, um, I'll do a, a cross promotion plug here for LLS's. Uh, We've got a, a podcast out and one of the um, the people that we interviewed recently was talking about that flexibility in his system that he he wanted to, during the drought, he was confinement feeding his his wieners and he was having all sorts of trouble with that. So instead he's, he's built a, a much better system and, and set up with his yard. So he's got all these holding pens. So he's able to, one, confinement feed his his wieners, but now he can he can also feed like cattle when the opportunity presents, and he's finding that he can he can use his cattle yards a lot better as well. Is that um, yeah. yeah, great great example, Rowan. So just thinking about that in terms of the design, like you might have you might have just said, okay, I'll design it for you know containment during drought, but actually, if you kind of tweak the design, you might be able to think about how can I use this as an advantage in terms of business, in terms of feed lotting or whatever it might be or you know making handling stock easier and you know of course people do this stuff all the time it's not like there's anything new in that kind of thinking but it's just getting more deliberate about it and actually starting to kind of use some you know rules if you like keep those in mind that how can i always look for that opportunity to build in flexibility how can i always look for the opportunity to build in that redundancy and just sort of making them part of the business so you know normally we've got rules in our mind about you know kind of efficiency or um you know sort of buying the best gear that that suits the job but bringing in another set of rules to have in, in your mind there as well to just make sure that every time you're making a decision that it's like is this going to give me more flexibility or less is this going to give me some backup or less you know has is there a couple of functions that this bit of gear can do or this design of this you know new yards or um, you know, laying out fences and um, thinking about, you know, another really practical example is just mobile water troughs. You, you know, you see that now the technology's around. It's just a really practical, simple idea that gives you a lot of flexibility. You don't have to have, you know, concrete troughs and, and pipe in the ground. You can you can move, have these, you know, troughs that move around. That just gives you a lot of flexibility. And I think it's sort of like a mindset almost about adopting that kind of mindset and getting that that in your head that, every opportunity I can I, I should be looking for to try to build in flexibility because I don't know what I'm going to need later on. Exactly. Hey, thanks Paul. Uh, yeah. Sharon, you've got a thanks, question. Well, that was a really good um, comment to uh, uh, Rowan's question. I've just got a, uh, a, a question about um, cooperatives and whether you've got experience um, working with co cooperatives in terms of building resilience in a community um, through that framework? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, most of us when we were growing up, you know, would have been aware there was lots of co-ops. Like the co-ops are a really common kind of um, organisation business structure when we were growing up and, and then they sort of went out of favour. But interestingly, they're starting to come back now. So there's, there is a lot of interest now in in developing co-ops and, and there's a number of co-ops that have emerged um, and there's still some really successful ones from those old days around. The, the, the thing that's interesting about co-ops is you, you need um, ways of running those that, that can cope with change as well. And, and so that's a, that's a business model that can, that can give you some flexibility but it also brings a lot of challenges in terms of uh, how they're governed. And, and that's where a lot of co-ops seem to struggle is in that kind of governance of them. But there's a huge emphasis on, on co-ops emerging in Europe and, and in the US. And, you know, I can see that there will be more co-ops here in the future. And sort of, it's a little bit back to the future, I think, in, in terms of, um, you know, localising things again, bringing it back more to the community level, communities being part of, and owning some of this sort of infrastructure that for a while has tended to move away to private organisations, private companies, that there is this bit of a trend back to things being more owned locally and, and shared. And, you know, when 
in Australia, we're just not very used to that idea as in the same way that I think a lot of other countries are. And to me, even thinking about co-ops around machinery and, and those sort of things too. And again, it's not something we're comfortable with and it's, you know, it's a bit of a cultural thing, I think, but I can see that that is going to become more and more common um, over time. And there's no doubt that that model has some resilience advantages to it. There's no doubt about that. But it's it's challenging. Gov you know, governing co-ops is a real challenge. Getting the rules right so that everyone gets their role um, right in that and gets their benefits and the benefits are shared and all that sort of stuff. But there's a hell of a lot of experience building up now around the world in in using co-ops to tackle some of these sort of problems. Thanks, Paul. That's great. I uh, just got a question in the chat box from Bill. I'm wondering if you've got some comment there, Paul. Uh, he asked, with the huge availability of information via online platforms, he finds that it is overwhelming to try and sort out what is relevant to his situation. What would be your approach to this? Yeah, good question, Bill. Um, and as we know, there's a lot of crap on the web as well, and it, it is hard to sort through it. A really kind of shortcut is to use the wisdom of crowds. So, um, you know, essentially putting the question out there, like if, if you're part of a forum or a, you know, whatever, is actually putting the question out there is what, what have people found that's good that's worked for them? And being quite specific to say, I think asking groups of people and say, I want, I've got this problem and I want something to solve this problem actually helps to sort out a lot of the noise so that's a, a way to sort of shortcut but being explicit about it so you be quite explicit i'm trying i've got this problem that i'm trying to solve and describing that problem so that you don't get just everyone jumping in with all their you know top of head sort of stuff actually being quite specific and saying i've got this problem has anyone else had this problem and have they solved it and if you look at um the technology forums, for example. So if you're trying to solve a technology problem, you go onto those forums that, um, you know, where all the nerds are, you can really, it's amazing. You can always find your problem. Like you can always, you can always, if you just Google your technical problem, you can always find someone else that's had that problem and there's a solution to it. And I think the, the reason that works is because you're actually defining the problem. So instead of, going and just saying, I'm looking for, you know, broadly just trying to search around and find information, actually defining your problem quite clearly. What is the type of information you're after? And getting that um, clear helps to shortcut. And if you can do that by asking a group of people, because then you've got a whole lot of brains that have already done that process and searched, et cetera. And again, that's just another, that's the sort of second step of shortcutting. So Define your problem really clearly, make sure you're asking the right question. And then if you can ask that question to a group of people, because that, you know, that's, you're sort of just leveraging off a whole lot of people. And it's a, it's a sort of quick way to, to get the wisdom of a crowd. They, they've done, someone in that crowd's done some of the work um, and you can define and refine fairly quickly. So, but I, I agree, it's, it's daunting all the stuff that's out there. Um, yeah. Kate, your question thanks. about yeah, thanks, Paul. Yeah, just about templates of pathways or questions of available to assist people to design for flexibility when planning for the future. There's sort of a few bits and pieces that are around, um, but nothing that I'd say, Kate, that would be just off the shelf that you'd use. But I think if you if you go back to that principle of um, flexibility and at every stage in what you're trying to design so or, or whatever you know problem you're trying to tackle if you just go through and you just apply that principle what's going to give us the most flexibility while still delivering what we need so you, you know you're trying to solve this problem what's going to give us the most flexibility at every step and so you know that's not going to that that's not a lot of direction, I know, but but it's not it's not going to give you detailed um, answers at a high. Um, what am I trying to say here? That's not going to that's not necessarily a very structured way in what you're asking for there. But it it will give you insights. It will give you information about you know 
the problem you're trying to solve and answering those sort of questions by just saying at every step, okay, say you're trying to build a set of yards like Rowan mentioned before. If you don't have that idea of flexibility in there right from the start, you, you might go through the whole process and design the yards and then you get to the end and you haven't um, really delivered yourself a lot of flexibility. And then you might try to add it in to the design there at the end. It's far better to have that principle right at the start and say, we want one of the things we want to achieve here is design, uh, is flexibility in the design. And then at every step after that, you've always got that principle in there that's going to deliver you through the whole process a better flexibility design at the end. So rather than try to just ask one question at one point, um, actually think about having it as a principle that's embedded so that at every point you're kind of asking yourself the question, is this going to give us more flexibility or less? Um, and answering that question at each stage is going to keep forcing you, pushing you into a pathway of, of more flexibility in the design. So that's why I quite like principles as, as a guide, um, that you can just use them constantly at different levels through some sort of process. So if, if you keep that principle embedded in what you're trying to do, you're gonna ultimately move towards a more flexible design. If you haven't got it there, you're gonna miss that out. So try and build that in right from the start and use it right through the process. Thanks, Paul, that's great. Uh, just going back quickly to Bill's comment um, and the approach, it's just like the farmers teaching farmers model, which has been so successful and which basically is peer teaching peers. So um, yeah. yeah, it works really, really well.